Uh, so this next session, uh, a speaker, a couple of fireside chats, and a panel is all going to be around the topic of keeping pace uh, with digital change in a rapidly changing world. And I think all of us uh, probably live, eat, breathe uh, the changing world and the digital revolution every single day. And I couldn't be more excited to be with uh, our speakers and our panelists. And to kick things off, um, Jim Stryker, Vice President of Operations Personal Lines at Cincinnati Insurance, is going to help us think about how carriers can realize a digital vision. I've been following Cincinnati for quite some time. I think you and your team are doing some really exciting things, and I'm sure our audience is going to uh, learn a lot from you, Jim. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, perfect thing is I took the slot right after the uh, break, which means the crowd's half. Uh, and I think half are actually from my company or, or from Des Moines. We've got Global Insurance Accelerators. Um, and the fact that I got my five foot eight self up the step was, I'm already a win. I didn't hurt myself, so it's good. Um, when I was 12, I was in the Navy. Um, and the reason I throw this out here is it's kind of changed the way my style is. It's a little less exotic than the folks you heard about from earlier today. Um, I tend to have a little more practical approach to innovation and things. Uh, I was a Navy supply officer, so not the top gun end of the things. I was at the other end. I was buying the parts for the cool guys that were flying planes, small carrier. But we delivered Marines for a living, which has also influenced kind of my approach. We work with an organization called Strategy Meets Action, or SMA. They're out of Columbus. Uh, they do a really interesting job of kind of analyzing the, the marketplace around digital, around innovation and things. And uh, Mark Breeding, who's one of the partners and I, have been colleagues forever. Uh, we were on a board years and years ago. Uh, and I did get his permission to do this. I think they've done a really nice job kind of explaining how it's working in the industry. And all of us have gone through the, we're digital. I, I put the policy in a PDF. We're good to go. We email it out. It's amazing. They can log in. They can get a document. What's also fascinating is everybody talks about the customer experience. And it's a huge part of the deal. Absolutely have to meet the customer where they're at. We talk about it all the time. But sometimes people think it's one or the other. I'm going to be operationally amazing. I'm going to make it really easy for underwriting, really easy for the technology and the data and the analytics. And unfortunately, the answer is you got to do both. Uh, and, and really, if you're going to get to the part where you're up in the transformation section, you're going to have to pay attention to the customer and work pretty hard to keep the expenses low. So there was a speaker earlier talking about kind of blowing everything up and spending hundreds of millions of dollars to to do that while it is important to have kind of a base structure. Uh, I don't know about you, but most carriers are worried about expense ratios. And we're trying to change the car while we're driving it, right? You still have filings. You still have products. You still have all those things. And then you're supposed to be transforming yourself at the same time while not spending a lot of money. And so uh, that's going to be kind of the angle that I'm taking uh, a little less dramatic. No one's handed me $100 million to do anything new lately. so. This slide is extraordinarily busy, and I'm not expecting anybody to kind of read through it. But again, this reinforces the kind of technology that we're talking about operational experience and the customer experience. And we're all trying to target the things in the top right quadrant. And really, what I want to kind of argue is the fact that while it would be lovely to be able to just stop, pick your point, and then have everyone in the organization do nothing but transform into this digital experience that is not necessarily the reality of how insurance companies operate. So talk a little bit about um, the next thing. So kind of back to my Navy days and setting a course. You got to have a plan. You got to have an idea of where you're trying to go. You've got to be open and new. One of the things that I find fascinating, and every time I go to one of these conferences, every time I talk to an accelerator, talk to a startup, they have amazing new perspective on something. Very old company, right? Been around forever. There's a way to do insurance and a way not. But you have to keep your mind open for it. So we always have the target state to try to focus on customers, try to focus on efficiency. And it's an everyday thing. I call it like the big game of uh, memory. 
I have a list of things that I need to do that I'm trying to hit my target, but at the same time, I don't know what all the amazing things that are available in the market yet. Every time you run into somebody, you can flip it over and say, hey, that, that match is something we're trying to do. Maybe we're gonna do it in a small way. And really making sure that everybody that you work with in the organization, on your team and others, is that they have the idea where we're going. So if they run across something that's amazing, we have an entire team of people here that they're constantly finding new opportunities out in the market new vendors, an entire room full over there, and everyone's trying to, to speak to the companies and, and be able to pitch, and, and these are the opportunities that we have. But what I'd argue, too, is that while maybe you can't afford to, to knock out a $100 million project each year, you have to plan for the, the innovation. You have to leave some space. We call it a swim lane, call it an opportunity, a pipeline. I know for us, it's really hard when you're having conversations with senior management and they have an entire new product or a new company they want to open up and you're doing all that, but you still have to slow some of that down and give an opportunity for the, the moonshot or the accidental amazing thing that happens. And over the years, we've run into a number of those. I mean, 20 years ago, before geolocation was a big deal, we had a startup that came to us and kind of showed us that we can do lat long, it was a good 20 years ago. We knew where the properties were, and it ended up being one of the largest geocoding uh, geospatial organizations in the United States and the world. And we, we partnered with them when they were early. They were a startup, just like some of these organizations are out here. If you don't give them an opportunity to at least test, experiment, you really have no opportunity to get the, the long-term benefit of it. And, and again, it's kind of back to that Navy thing. You're, you're at sea, you can't just call in and ask for a part. You better have a plan and you need to kind of mess around with the things that you already have. Give them a shot, kind of move on. And then the other analogy that we use is uh, sailing. And I don't know how many people sail in this room, but one of the things that's interesting is sometimes you have to go a different direction than exactly where you're going when you're heading into the wind. We call it tacking. It's my favorite part of sailing. Uh, it's, it's exciting, but it's also sometimes uh, confusing to everybody watching why you're going over there. That's not really the direction we're going. And the answer is you got to be willing to take opportunities that aren't going to work out. And lots and lots of them don't. And it's the hardest part of innovation. It's the hardest part of the digital kind of journey that you go through uh, is allowing yourself to stink. I'm good at it. Like, I, I stink every day. I mean, it's, you saw me climb up on the stage. It was amazing. Uh, you know, you have to give yourself an opportunity to fail. Uh, not every one of these organizations is going to hit a home run. Not every one of these is going to work out for your company. But at the same time, if you aren't willing to test, to play with it, to give them an opportunity, you don't really get the chance that we did to have some success around, say, geolocation. Um, and again, <laughs> plan for the nonsense. I have a more colorful term that we use for that from the Navy, but they told me I shouldn't. Um, but again, you have to expect nonsense. Plan for it, embrace it. Like I literally have designated time and capacity for nonsense and knuckleheadedness and mistakes. It's okay. It's gonna eventually, as long as you keep moving and tacking in the general direction for where you're trying to go, that is a legit opportunity. Um, and again, I love the, the conversation earlier with AM Best. They were talking about measuring and being able to say, every one of your successes should be measurable. And they should be, but they aren't always. And sometimes you have to be willing to let yourself not be measurable. Did it move us forward? Did we learn something? Are we? absolutely helping the organization. So this right here, it, it seems really ridiculous. This is Tinker Toys for the folks in the room that are too young to remember this. Um, but this is literally what I think is the, the key to the way insurance companies work. It's fascinating. In almost every company, you have many of the parts necessary to do some really forward-thinking, amazing innovation, and it already exists in your building. You have no idea it's there, 
or maybe it's for something else. Now, the discussion earlier about China, you're like, yeah, that's not really, you know, 400 million customers, they just shifted things around, it was no big deal, they had another half a million customers. But the, the root of what they were saying is they had something in the organization that worked on digital photographs for claims on auto. And then they figured out, hey, wait a minute, if I take a picture of a cow, I can figure out it's the same cow that passed away. We're going to have ag insurance. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. There are lots of opportunities in every organization. We're a multi-line carrier, commercial, personal, ENS. Heck, we even have a syndicate in uh, Lloyd's. There are groups of technology. There's groups of processes that aren't necessarily technology. All of them have an opportunity to be something you can use to move forward. And again, back to that beachhead. It's OK to bring somebody in, test it out, kind of the Marines. You let the Marines play with it. If they like it, Army will buy it if it works. They don't want to be the one experimenting. The Marines will. Same kind of thing. If you can experiment and prove value, fantastic. The geolocation is a great example. 20 years ago, commercial lines mint and money. They don't really need to know where a lot of things are because that the pressure to drive efficiency is way different than personal lines. You know, we were getting pressed up against the commodity move decades before that became a thing in commercial lines. And I think now that technology and competition, land, small business, all these things, it's pushing really hard for the same efficiency plays that we had in personal lines 15, 20 years ago. So be open to the memory game and say, hey, that worked for them. I wonder if I could take the same technology. You've already gone through the spanking machine of security, contracting, legal, and all those things in the, in the organization. You can get that done in your group faster. Uh, and again, simple enough. Not as exotic as the one talking about the largest insurance carrier in uh, China. But again, kind of perspective. Be open to small. Be open to making mistakes. Keep driving towards that kind of thing for op operational efficiency. I'd be happy to uh, take questions. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, if there are any questions, please use the app now. We have just a couple minutes. Um, Jim, I love the Tinker Toy analogy. Not only did I play a lot with Tinker Toys and Legos and, and all that back in the day, but it was, uh, like you said, starting with the pieces that you already have. And I think uh, so many of our carriers who are struggling through their own transformation and their own culture of innovation journeys uh, really haven't figured out how to tap into that. So not only the technology, I mean, you think about how much technology is even in these devices, how much machine vision, how much machine learning, geotagging, all of that, the GPS is already in here. Same thing with our people. You know, we have people that maybe go home and geek out on you know, crypto or geek out on drones or you know, smart devices at their homes. How are you thinking about tapping into the resources, the tech that you already have? Right, well, and we've even been talking about using what we have in a different way. Yeah. So you know, policy admin systems, we have these great big systems, front end for agents that can use uh, huge databases. But they, they mentioned it in the panel earlier as kind of meeting the customer where they're at. And one of the things that we find is large brokers really aren't interested in being in your system. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that the engine that drives your system with rules and rates and all the uh, benefits of the models that you've created aren't valuable to them. That's absolutely your product. But you can use that same thing with an API and present it into their system. They don't need to be in your system to produce. Yeah. Uh, same kind of thing. So, uh, and again, to your point, the phone is meant to be a phone, but now it's a voice, you know, it's music, it's, access to the information of the world, it it's everything. It's how I found my, how to get to this place, right? It's how I found the restaurant last night, my phone. Yeah, so uh, we're almost out. I have time for maybe one question. We did have a, a couple come through. So obviously, in modern architecture, APIs really helps on the, the technology side. But as the carriers, you start you know, using multiple solutions. Uh, does it get to be like a little spaghetti and everything interconnected? How do you kind of keep the IT straight? Yeah, we try to keep the main foundational system to be the, the anchor point. And they said it early on in one of the other uh, conversations is if you have a strong core system, mm -hmm. you can hang 
any kind of technology off of that, whether it's experimental or direct, uh, that has been a real driver for us to, and I like to brag, we have one database. Yeah. So for all of our uh, PNC, personal lines, middle market, high net worth, ENS, all of it, one database. Those are the kind of things that we feel was important to make sure that then when we bring in other cool technologies as an opportunity, it still works. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's a different game if you have to kind of move data around between them, but it's also possible. Well, Jim, uh, questions have actually started flooding in now, and of course, now that we're about out of time, so I'm going to pick one just to close, sure. I think is a, a good place to, to close. How do you get your leadership to buy into uh, the view, the vision, ensuring resources uh, are available uh, to go out and to innovate? We've been blessed a lot. Our, our senior executives kind of already had a lot of that, we want to be the best, we want to be entrepreneurial. Um, our CEO is an actuary accountant. So we count everything a lot. <laughs> yeah, so everybody's shaking their heads like, oh. Yeah, we get it. <laughs> Absolutely, a, one of the funniest human beings too. He's just wonderful. But a lot of our executives, we're a very flat organization, and thank God they kind of operate a lot like the Navy did, where it was, you're empowered to make decisions. You're, it's okay to make mistakes. We say it all the time. We're in insurance. Don't make artificial hearts for babies. You can bind it on a napkin and account, so there really aren't emergencies. They're willing to let us experiment. Uh, and as you've met Wendy, you know, we, we really are trying to make sure that we are awesome to the customer, doing all the right things, blocking, tackling every day, but allowing ourselves to, to try things and, and to do things that are a little spooky for somebody in the middle of the Midwest, right? So. Well, Jim, I think that was a, not only a great wrap up, but a great tee up for the fireside chats and conversations that we're going to have next. So Jim, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, so really kind of picking up where Jim left off, we're going to go a little bit deeper now into a couple themes. And, uh, you know, as a venture capitalist in the insure tech space, I get asked a lot of time, you know, what are you excited about? What are you seeing? And there's just so many technologies, so many uh, opportunities, and so many really amazing founders and entrepreneurs that are bringing new perspectives as to how we bring new technologies into the insurance industry. So I think the next fireside chat, uh, which is going to focus around no code and low code and adoption in the carrier space is going to be a lot of fun. So um, Christopher and uh, I mean Charles and Corbin, uh, come on up. Are we going to spread out, right? Right? I don't know. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right. We'll so uh, talking about no code, low code, I think uh, you know, just give you uh, each a minute or two to introduce yourselves to our audience and also the organization that uh, you work with. Sure, my name is Corbin. I'm a director of product management at LifeRay, and we uh, help companies build digital experience. Um, that might be portals, that might be your website or e-commerce experiences, but regardless of what it is, uh, we help give you the platform to build it and also to improve on it over time. And um, some of our uh, customers include AGIA, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, as well as uh, Church Mutual, just to name a few. Cool. I'm Charles Merritt. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Buddy. Uh, we've built the first uh, insurance line of business agnostic insurance gateway, and we're the easiest way to implement insurance on the internet. That's uh, short and sweet. So let's dig right into that. Uh, you know, I know so many carriers are thinking about low code, no code. It's almost to the point where it's become kind of a, a buzz. And a lot of folks uh, in leadership positions are still trying to figure out what does that mean for them. So let's kind of simplify it and start with what are the benefits of adding you know, a, a low code, no code technology uh, toolkit? Sure. Uh, so from our perspective, you know, Buddy is an insurance specific technology and, and you all are a horizontal technology. Uh, so y you are probably the qualified expert on low code, no code, but I'll, I'll do the wrong answer first. <laughs> um, so for us, we look at low code and no code tools as ways to enable the digital goodness 
without requiring all of the developer resources of doing a custom API implementation uh, or rolling your own on a software build. So we see it as an unlocking mechanism mm -hmm. for a lot of the value that's being created through new digital core systems or digital distribution opportunities. Um, and we can kind of shortcut a lot of the developer requirements uh, through low-code and no-code tools. That's a long list of potential benefits. Uh, Corbin, what do you think? What's uh, what's the the, the two-second uh, two-cent version of what's uh, what's the benefit to an insurance carrier? Yeah, when we think about it uh, about low-code, it really comes down to a core belief that everyone in your organization has ideas for how to innovate and has ideas for how to improve the business. But not everyone in your organization is an engineer or has the tools that engineers have. So low code makes it accessible for more people in your organization to implement those process changes or perhaps just do simple things that used to require developers, like updating your website without having to have that developer expertise. I imagine we have some folks in the audience who are saying, OK, that all sounds good, but I really don't know what that means for me and how I would actually you know, turn employees loose uh, to go out and, and build things uh, in a no-code, low-code environment. So maybe it'd be great to take a couple minutes and just walk through a case study of sure. you know, what that means, how a carrier could think about implementing such a solution and uh, what the results might be too. Do you want me to start with one? We can yeah. start with one outside of insurance, which sure. is yeah. uh, a very simple but powerful idea. To, to demonstrate that low code doesn't have to be this big thing, it can be solving very small problems. And it, oftentimes, it's, it's really powerful when it solves small problems that maybe IT isn't willing to invest a lot of effort into, but makes a big impact on the day-to-day -day of your employees. So uh, a large airport uh, based in the UK used low code, and they implemented it on a small scale to start to see what types of ideas people had. And someone who just worked at the, the security counter, um, got wind of this program and, and realized, hey, we, we have something that we've wanted to do for a long time, which is take this book that's about 800 pages long and put it on an app so we don't have to print this book every time we want to make changes to the guidelines. And so they saw it as an opportunity. They learned how to use a low-code platform. They implemented that book in all of the eight languages that it was supported so that the user could log in and, and read it in the language that they prefer. And they no longer had to print those books. And that's something that's a, uh, you know, not, would not have been on the highest priority list for IT to tackle, per se. But when you put it in the hands of the developer, it had a huge impact on their process and, and ended up saving them a, a fair change. Nice. Yeah. Um, so we, have, uh, we had a, a couple of great success stories in low-code implementation. So one is a carrier that we work with had a product that they were distributing through traditional broker channels, and they had sort of the home page branded landing page for it. Um, but they were running on a system that wouldn't integrate with that sort of uh, website builder. And so their marketing, marketing team used a low-code, no-code website builder, Wix, to stand up a branded landing page. We ingested their paper product, not even an API distributed product, and manuals into our engine. We gave them a copy-paste implementation of our gateway, and their marketing team copy-pasted it, and now it has native e-commerce inside of their Wix page, and they spun up a D2C uh, brand around that product in three to five minutes of implementation time of the insurance product, plus the Wix site build time. Uh, and from what I'm watching in the industry, I think that is incredibly exciting. You know, uh, it's more externally facing from a marketing perspective. I mean, let's face it, all carriers out there on their websites already list, you know, in commercial lines. Mm -hmm. Here are all the industries that we support. And some of those, you know, are really tailored, you know, specific coverages, specific forms. Others are just more marketing. Yes, we write, you know, dry cleaners or, you know, uh, whatever the case might be. But technology, and especially no code or, or low code development, I think is really promising almost hyper-personalization. Yep. So that, because you can stand up products and websites and everything in absolutely minutes to really target a specific audience down to what the look and feel on the language that they would want to see. Yep, so Jason, there's yeah. one thing I wanted to touch on that Corbin and I were talking about yeah, earlier. 
Um, you know, no code and low code tools are definitely great for non technical users. Uh -huh. But one of the things that we were talking about outside is that developers also really like them because they reduce the amount of custom code that's being built. Yeah. Uh, and you know, when we're thinking about implementation in distribution environments, you know, we do a lot of work in embedded insurance as well. So oftentimes, those are developers whose main job is building an e-commerce system, right? Uh -huh. It's not implementing insurance. Yeah. And so the tools massively reduce that implementation time. Well, because it also then kind of gives guide rails too. That's right. Even within you know this the slick no code, low code, there's only certain things you can do, but you can anyone can do it and do it very quickly and well. Um, maybe about if so, a couple examples more kind of externally facing. What about for some of internal processes? Are you seeing any examples where companies are, you know, using these types of tools, you know, internally as well? Absolutely. We saw we see a lot of companies. Um, let's say in the sales organization, uh, building out automation and processes using low-code tools. We see them um, modeling internal processes that were forms-based applications, you know, that were paper, pencil forms, uh, giving the sales leaders the tools to just build those themselves and not have to, to rely and, and wait for IT to be a blocker. Obviously, in the marketing side, uh, landing pages is a great example, but also um, internal ways of gathering feedback from your sales network, or maybe from uh, other regions that you're outside of, um, just building out surveys and, and ways of gathering feedback, uh, all, all the process improvements. Yeah. So for us, the way our engine works uh, is that our we basically create a master blueprint of an insurance product. And then we can, in a low code environment, configure instances of that product. Sure. And so that's where we're seeing, you know, other than implementation, of course, but that's where we're seeing our, our largest internal use case today. You know, um, I think the notion of empower, empowering employees to develop new tools, new products, and just to run with it and deliver is incredibly exciting. I'm sure for some of us, myself included, would also be a little nervous <laughs> about how are you kind of managing uh, the responsibility, the accountability for what's being done. So how is that shift kind of happening and what's the, your advice to carriers who are you know, exploring those types of solutions? I don't know that I'm going to give carriers any advice that's going to help them. Sure. Um, you know, I think the way we think about it is multi-tier permissioning, right? So let's assign yeah. specific yeah, roles and responsibilities. And you know, if the carrier tells us this person can take these actions, we say, great, they get this kind of user permissions. So that's the way that we handle it. But I think it, it connects to what was said just before, which is we need to be comfortable with experimentation is yeah. to start. We can't, on one hand, say we want to innovate. We want to give uh, people the, the safety net to fail mm -hmm. with their innovation without then saying also, well, please don't fail. <laughs> so uh, I see a strong connection between innovation and, and low code because low code really does democratize development. It gives people the chance to uh, create something very quickly and test it out and experiment with it and then see if it works or, or doesn't work. And, and obviously, you can scope what you give people the power to do by saying, OK, only work in these specific domains that are lower stakes. That, um, but uh, like you said, yeah, um, I, I think uh, we have to be a bit comfortable with, with the possibility of failure, yeah, for right. sure. Uh, uh, I'm going to pause and remind the audience this is a great time to start submitting your questions for, uh, for Charles and Corbin. So I'm going to, that's all been great. Well, I'm going to want to pause for a second and say, OK, what are the disadvantages or what are things maybe that aren't as appropriate for no code, low code? Hmm. I think. Uh, well, IT and the line of business is always going to have two competing goals with IT wanting to care cover, uh, about security and governance and, and line of business caring about speed, agility, and, and flexibility. And so mm -hmm. um, I think low code sort of sits at that tension point. Um, and uh, low code is not going to be your solution for everything. There's still a need for developers. Uh, and um, I think. Uh, that where the technology, um, you're still going to need governance, especially when it comes to accessing customer data 
and when it comes to um, security concerns. So uh, absolutely scope certain domains that don't necessarily need that requirement and, um, or, or just know that IT is going to need to get involved anytime it comes down to compliance or it, it comes down to sensitive information or security. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I think from our experience where we tend to uh, get a little more custom and under the hood is when we think about you know, speed and infrastructure, you know, what kind of environments are we building on, how can we increase response time, you know, those types of more technical experimentation mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the sort of information architecture of insurance, right? That, those building blocks are pretty easy to move around, so benefits, data fields, validation, uh, even, even workflows, um, contact routing, payments routing, those are all sort of very building block components. Uh, but thinking about network call speed and things that I'm very lucky to have um, an excellent CTO co-founder uh, and um, uh, head of infrastructure to worry about. Sure. Uh, you know, those are the types of things where at least we're very focused on getting it exactly right down to the you know, nanosecond uh, as opposed to ease of use from a building block perspective. Yeah. Great. So a couple questions from the audience I'm going to tap into here. Um, how do you recommend properly testing a low-code application? You know, usually um, a standard developer would have the know-how to create automated testing, test data alongside with their code. How does testing work in this space? So for us, we actually generate uh, test data. So if you're in some of our building environments, we will understand the type of data that you want to generate, and we will spin up fake customers' application data files to run through. Uh, we use this with compliance teams, and we use this with product teams to be able to walk them through entire workflows, both from an individual UI perspective, but also from a data batching perspective. So you know, we can submit you know, batch files, SFTP, API calls, uh, all with dummied up data, whether we're generating it or you know, pulling a feed from uh, you know, an underwriting API or a Google Maps API or, or what have you. Okay. Yeah, great. And on top of that, also making sure that you have staging environments as well for this so that you're obviously drafting something before you push it abroad. And as part of that publication workflow, you can have someone from IT involved to take a look at it as well as versioning so you can always roll back your, your application or whatever you're building in low code. And it also goes back to permissioning as well, right? So you yeah. can have a builder level permissioning, a reviewer level permissioning, and then publishing level permissioning. Yeah. You know, and I like to overly simplify things. Uh, but when I've thought about, you know, some low code, no code examples, sometimes to me it's like the difference between like Apple and Android, right? You know, some things that uh, the connectivity of the platform just kind of works, but you can only do so much. And then other people want to be able to do a lot more. They don't want to have the restrictions. They want to be able to do any tweaks or reprogramming or anything on their phone. I mean, this even goes back to you know Windows versus DOS once upon a time. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of along that line, a question from the audience was, you know, experiencing negative receptivity from software engineers. Mm. Uh, as low code, no code tools do not keep them as marketable? Or how are you, are you seeing reception, you know, people, uh, developers in particular saying, hey, we don't want to work in no, low code, no code because we're developers? Or how does a, uh, a company or a carrier think about kind of managing that balance with their own workforce? I wouldn't say that we have seen that trend. Okay. Um, most of the developers that we work with, especially on the demand side, um, are quite happy to not have to do as much work to integrate insurance. Um, and I think that, again, the in the spirit of what Jim was saying earlier, in creating lots of opportunities to do lots of experiments and tacking this way and that way, it's a great way to say, hey, here are some process workflow things that we do all the time. Yeah. Like, let's low code those and go find 30 other things we can do experiments with. And so I think, you know, in that environment, um, you know, it's really about the, the culture and what you're permitting your developers to go do an experiment with, yeah. as opposed to, you know, do, if, if they're justifying their job by doing repetitive tasks, yeah. then no, that's, that's, a like, point. that's a tough environment, you know? Uh, it's gotta be more engaging to do, you know, real builds versus just kind of yeah. you know, copy, paste, repeat, you know, for something that can be more replicated. You know, Corbin, um, 
there's always going to be, I think, this debate for many of us between you know speed and quality. With no code, low code, is that a choice, or can you really have both? I mean, I'd like to say that you can have both, but <laughs> yes, I understand that logically there's there's going to be some trade-offs. Um, but I would I would more uh, think about it less in terms of speed and quality, and, and perhaps. Um, speed and flexibility. What you do lose sometimes with low code is flexibility, and uh, you're not going to have the same toolkit that a developer has. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think the way that low code tools are built, uh, the quality tends to be there, and it's, it's less a uh, trade-off in, in quality. It, um, and again, uh, your, the people on the ground who don't have those developer um, know-how oftentimes obviously understand the business a lot better. And so what I see oftentimes is um, that tension between the business knowing how the business works and what needs to be done and the, the technologists not. And this really solves that problem. And so that I, I think about that benefit a lot more than I think about a loss in quality per se in your uh, occurring tech debt. Well, let's also bring something <laughs> in from our earlier conversation. I want to leave the good parts on the cutting room, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also, what is the paradigm we are looking at, right? So it's one thing to say, oh, I can't do a custom, you know, whatever with a low-code tool, but it is another thing to say, this is an Accord form or a fillable PDF that somebody sent me, and here's a mobile-friendly low-code application, yeah. right? Like, let's talk about the paradigm as opposed to, like, the future-perfect state that I think Sure, we all aspire to, but like, let's, let's ground it a little bit, too. Yeah, absolutely. So another question from the audience. Um, do you see low and no-code capability being consumed within more traditional solution providers in the future? So right now, it's you know, new providers you know, bringing this in. Do you see more traditional solution providers kind of going that direction? Mm -hmm. And then the spirit of configuration and tier permissions, as you mentioned, how will low-code Provider stay most relevant and independent. Mm. That's a tough question. Well, I think the the independent part, um, you know, probably pertains to people's checkbook sizes, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of relevancy and whether they'll be pulled into institutional, um, you know, more institutional organizations as opposed to startup or early stage, I mean, I think I think it's a natural progression, right? Like, if you look at technology progression overall. It trends toward making things usable and making things simpler for us to extract the value out of some core innovation, right? So, low code is kind of where we are in that moment, um, but in the future, you know, it will be precognition or you know whatever, right? Like I'll think about an idea and the application will generate itself. Well, you're starting to answer my last question, yeah. and I think we are about out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and just throw it back out there. What's next? What's next for low code, no code? Where is this going? Well, looking at other industries um, that are further along on their their digital maturity, um, I think that, that was such a nice way to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we see um, a lot of modular services, and they went through this this process already of breaking up their systems into modules and having them all talk to each other via API. They've already gone through that process, and they've seen. Um, some of the benefits and also a lot of the challenges. And so I, I see that for the insurance industry, the direction it's going. And therefore, you're uh, putting low-code tools in your, your employees' hands, and they're able to get that integration down in a low-code way as well. Uh, you get a lot of powerful um, applications there, because I think right now we're still at a point where um, the, the heavy lifting still is going to be done outside of low code. And, um, and in addition to that, the integration into the low code app is, is also a challenge. So that's uh, what I see on the horizon for low code insurance industry. Thanks, Corbin. Charles, anything else to add on that vein? You know, I, I will definitely support the modularity. I mean, that, that's the way that we built the back end of our platform is that if you know, we work with some carriers who want to use their fulfillment, some who yep. want to use ours, right? And so thinking about low code not only as the way in which you build an interface or a workflow, but lower code 
no code as a way you can figure the functions of the software. So low code architecture versus low code interface. Uh, I think that's sort of the next, you know, next lily pad over as we're jumping across the pond. Awesome. Charles Corbin, thank you both for your time, for your insights today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Good job. Thanks, guys. Uh, so now we're going to go uh, with a slight pivot, but still on the same vein. And we're going to talk about um, intelligent automation. Talk about another set of buzzwords, because it, it means so much to so many. But please uh, uh, welcome Eileen Potter and Prashant Hinge to the stage for our next fireside chat. I'd like to think I'm more than another set of buzzwords. But well, and I think you're going to prove that's the case. Fair enough. So uh, actually, let's take a minute. And uh, Eileen, Prashant, please uh, introduce yourselves, who you're with, what brings you to Nashville today. So um, I'm Eileen Potter. Um, I'm in Nashville because this is where all the best insurance people are right now. That's right. Um, so I'm with Abby. I have been here about a year and a half. So um, Abby does two things really well for insurers. The first thing we do is we help insurers understand their processes, um, how they're working today and how they're not working through process and task mining. Um, the other thing we do is intelligent document processing. A lot of people call it OCR, but um, modern no-code, low-code IDP is different from, from OCR. So mm -hmm. Charles gave me a really good intersection to, to talk about. It's, um, it's more than just an interface. It's, it's a new way of development. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Prashant Inge, and uh, I'm with the Hanover Insurance Group. And uh, I am uh, currently responsible for automation that includes everything from RPA to AI to chatbots, low-code, no-code uh, application building, uh, and uh, also responsible for employee experience. And it's my first time in Nashville. Uh, I don't think our habit of blue has changed, even after COVID. So I still <laughs> see 80% of us in blue, which is, I think, old habits die hard. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation and meeting a lot of you uh, around here and just share ideas. Yeah, well, and, and getting to know both of you uh, for today, I feel like you guys don't even need a moderator. The two of you could just riff on this <laughs> subject uh, and be really engaging. but. I'm going to try to you know, kind of get things started uh, and a little off script. So Eileen, we were yeah. talking just before about sometimes uh, the risk and challenges of technology for technology's sake or innovation for innovation's sake. And there's certainly a lot of buzz around you know, RPA and machine learning and machine vision and all these things. So uh, kind of start us off with, um, give us that context. What should we be thinking about in terms of intelligent automation? So I think we have to really take it back to how insurers in general look at technology. And so um, I would say I'm old enough to remember when there really wasn't any, and wasn't any insurance technology and everything was manually done. And then I worked on really early core systems, which were not too configurable, but um, it was really exciting at the time. The idea that something would actually rate a policy and print it out was a really big deal. But then you move on to more modern core systems, much more configurable, but still essentially, you know, insurance transactions, if you guys think about it, they really haven't changed. You know, there's policy, there's claims, there's underwriting. It's it's all pretty much the same. But the opportunity we have now with these new technologies is to to be able to make the transactions work better, to understand processes in a data driven way, to really be able to um, to automate things differently and, and to be able to help. You talk about employee experiences. How can you help your underwriters make better decisions? How can you help your adjusters make better decisions? Those are the opportunities that we, can, that we have now to you know, just get better outcomes overall. Yeah, Prashant, I love that um, kind of the, the breadth but yet focus of the responsibilities that you have at Hanover. And so maybe just even for a level set, you know, what does RPA, robotic process automation, machine learning, what does that mean to you and to Hanover? Uh, so I think to, to really begin with, uh, to build on what Eileen is saying here, uh, these new tools and technologies, I just want to set the stage by saying that they are not special. They've been here for a long time. They'll continue to evolve and be here. Yeah. They're just a tool in our toolkit. 
they're just newer, we're trying to understand it, so that's why a lot of attention and marketing, everything that goes around with it. So the way we see this, or have evolved into this, was not leading with the technology, what can technology do, but to Eileen's point earlier, looking at across the fragmented processes and see how can we do two things. One is provide data to our underwriters, adjusters, accountants to make better decisions. And second, how can we reduce friction in the system so employees can work successfully in a hybrid uh, environment from in a, in a long-term uh, perspective. Now for that, if you need robotics, if you need API gateways, if you need machine learning to do content extraction, if you need chatbots to uh, further tie these things together and then also interact with our agents and customers better, that can be a tool that we can bring in to solve a specific problem. So that's how we will get those things. So just kind of like with the last fireside chat, I think uh, before we go too much further, I think it's important to give some context. So maybe let's talk use cases. Okay. So if you could maybe share uh, a use case, an example uh, of successful you know, RPA, you know, machine learning implementation. Uh, I know I've seen it in so many different departments in so many different ways. <coughs> so maybe pick an example or two just to kind of give some context for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with yep. the technology. Um, so we have a customer um, they're, I would never say a legacy insurer, but they're an establi established insurance carrier. They have a lot of systems, as many established <laughs> insurance carriers do, and so they used a combination of intelligent document processing and RPA to speed their underwriting process. So they're able to, you know, what are the outcomes you want? You want to write more new business. You want to retain the business that you have. And so that, you know, the combination of intelligent document processing and RPA has enabled them to increase the amount of new business that they've written by, I think it's jumped, it was, I think, 50% the first year, and probably closer to 20 the second year, and, and better retention. And a lot of this was kind of pre-COVID, and so you talking about this yeah. too, you know, the game really changed. I mean, I can't speak to the amount of, of insurance executives who laughed and said, if you'd said we were going to you know, be completely remote over a weekend, they would have said we can never do that. Okay. that no, that's never going to happen. And so you know, going forward, and you talk right. about that, all of this stuff has to be rethought. Your processes really need to have to you know, think about them now in a hybrid environment. There's no going back to the way it was before. So for underwriting example, um, improving the underwriting processes, is that automation you know, just kind of taking some of the tasks off and, and automating things that the underwriter used to have to do so they can focus on more, you know, value added parts of the role? Or is it bringing in new information that wasn't available? I think it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The right answer is it's about what do we do today? How do we do reimagining that context and providing that information in the simplest form possible? Uh, by reading emails, by extracting information from third-party websites, by uh, extracting information from a card firms, uh, or any other form that's, uh, that comes in, right? So that in itself it was uh, an enigma a few years ago, but now you can solve for those problems. But having said that, you are just it's just optimization. The, yeah. the true innovation happens when, instead of looking at 10 or 15 risk parameters, I can look at 50 or 75 and dig deeper into and make better risk decisions. So rather than spending time in this manual effort that I'm putting in, I would rather spend equivalent amount of time in doing that work and add and contribute to my KPIs, like loss ratio, expense ratios, mm -hmm. overall, and make them better. So I think that's the trade-off, and that's a transition we are still in, uh, yes. in getting there. I don't think we are completely there yet. Well, and I think that's a great point because you know so many of the early RPA implementations that I was a part of were really just about that optimization. Mm -hmm. You know, taking some of these manual things where right. you know a human used to have to go in and take these things out of emails and copy and paste into another system, and really just automating that. Yes, it's an improvement, it's an optimization, but that doesn't mean that the underlying process has been improved. It's just automating something that's already there, right? And, and so, so two points to this. I think it comes down to simple versus complex. So is this personal lines, and this can be automated straight through, and you don't need a human in the loop. And um, you know, talking about something like with claims earlier, is my windshield broken? 
I just need to know where to get it fixed. I don't need any empathy. I just need to know to get this, to get this claim closed. But if it's complex underwriting, you're not going to automate it straight through. You still need an underwriting. You can use the technologies you know, to, to make it better. And one more thing, I guess now I just think about, it's not about making a manual process a digital process. It's about reimagining the process. Yeah. Do you need all the steps you have? You, you might not. Maybe you need different steps. or It's not even about an amount. It's, right. it's about changing that, think, rethinking it all. And, and that's why language is so important in a couple of places. One is to communicate effectively with the leadership and the employees on the why. Mm -hmm. And second is we throw the jargons around intelligent, smart. We don't ca call our cars smart. They're just cars. Mm -hmm. We were just had manual driving 20 years ago. Now we don't. We have win uh, uh, windows that uh, uh, operate on its own. <laughs> it's just smart. <laughs> we don't call it smart cars. Yeah. So that's why the, the language, I think, is very important to level set. Well, and that's definitely the uh, the evolution, and uh, I too use the word Eileen legacy a lot. Not just about carriers, but about like we've all used the word legacy platforms, mm -hmm. uh, legacy. Uh, in fact, I you know I've been with some carriers. I'm like, yeah, calling your systems legacy makes it sound like it's newer than it really is. <laughs> so whatever is older than legacy, mm -hmm. but um, the shift is real. And so much of that shift, as we've been you know, hearing times about you know, the mobile, digital, but it also gets back to the customer, yes. right? So much of this is also driven by you know, being able to have self-service and having customers do things on the own. And when I think about customers, I don't just think about the policyholder you know, being able to get on an app and to have an experience that's automated, whether it's um, you know, through the app or through a chat bot or whatever else. I think it's about our agents and brokers, our distribution partners, because <laughs> they are customers using that. And it's even our own employees. Mm -hmm. And giving them the power to be able to self-service and do things on their own. So really broad question, but when you think about the customer self-service opportunities with automation, where are we and where do you think that's going? Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> So I think actually we've done a pretty good job from, from a self-service. We've come a long way from a self-service <laughs> standpoint. Um, but I feel like it's, um, I know you said term lipstick on a pig. So if you have this really great app and you can submit your claim or submit your policy and it goes through. And it's easy, it's done, you've submitted it, everything's great. And then on the back end it's a tangled web of garbage and so, you know, you know, for everybody internally, so they expect it to be all great because it was so easy to submit. And on the inside, systems aren't talking to each other. People aren't connecting. Um, I think that's part of the whole idea of, of really reimagining your processes because it's not just a beautiful app. It's, you need to make the internal processes as beautiful and as slick as that application is because Otherwise, it's, um, I think that's an opportunity for low code to connect things faster. You know, maybe you don't need to rip in or replace your core systems. What do you need to connect? But you know, I, I just think that's, I guess it, I think we've come a long way and certainly apps could need to, you know, there's always improvements to be made, but I think the, we've not done a lot of improving on the inside from, from what I've seen. And if you see how uh, industry is shifting, right? We are still not there yet. We went from uh, our technology transformation was deploying a large scale, massive project or a core system. Yeah. Uh, uh, and any workarounds exceptions were left for people to handle. That's where we started off with uh, RP a few years ago, uh, for example, as an industry. But now, I think the two things that are happening, you can't just say employee or customer, it's and. Uh, customer, you have to think about it uh, both at the same time. And what you are also, uh, what I also see is, we have uh, through the self-service tools that we have built so far, solved for some of the basic five, six, seven, eight scenarios uh, that apply to our customers. But for us to truly provide the Amazon or the Netflix experience, you have to, to your point, undo, unpack some of the internal 
uh, systems and processes and data in order to turbocharge uh, and, and go to that next level. I think that's where uh, we are all trying to figure out how do you do that because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so quick reminder, audience, great time to start submitting your questions. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to run out of time before we know it, so uh, get those in um, pretty quickly. So we talked about you know, more of the external facing. I want to go back to the, the internal facing as well because um, bringing our employees uh, on this journey, uh, rethinking our processes, reimagining uh, so much of the opportunity with RPA, machine learning, et cetera, um, is around boosting employee productivity, you know, reducing costs. Uh, I think almost everyone uh, across our industry and so many others have really been challenged with workforce shortages. You know, I think you know, two years ago, uh, so many people were saying, well, all this automation is just going to you know, put us out of jobs. Or we're going to have these layoffs. And now here we are you know, really uh, strapped for talent in so many ways. Uh, how is RPA and ML being leveraged by carriers today, do you think, to do more with what you already have? Uh, uh, I think uh, what the sense uh, of realization is that it's not either or, it's yeah. again, it's that and, and it's about uh, augmentation and how do we create that, uh, the buzzword thrown around is three through processing. Uh, I'm gonna make it even longer by saying three through processing with human enable. I think that's the key here because nothing in insurance can go out without the eyeballs, that's when you get in trouble. So I think that is where the industry is shifting. And if you look at the demographics, because of all the talent shortages that we're talking about, retirements coming down the road, uh, et cetera, I think insurance companies need to find the right balance of how can we bring in the new talent, get them excited with the technology, while at the same time do this massive knowledge transfer from old to the new. Uh, while at the same time innovating. That's a challenge, it's doable, but that's where I feel uh, like you have to create that exciting experience for the employees, and this is what I uh, say all the time. Automation or this space, innovation, is 20% technology, it's 80% about change management, building the bridges between business and technology, aligning with business strategy. Those components are really important. You can't just lead with technology and say this shiny object is going to solve this problem for you. Mm -hmm. You were talking about using the word legacy. There's legacy culture, yeah. and that that <laughs> that holds you back more than more than anything. You know, yeah. you said you can use the technology. You're right. It's not good or bad. It's how it's used. Yeah, and we're going to dig into that topic a little more with our our next panel. Uh, but I'm going to maybe kind of tee it up a little bit because even from my own experience, uh, I've seen so much resistance to change mm -hmm. uh, in so many organizations that I have an opportunity to work with. But once organizations start the journey and start actually showing that they will do something about it, it's oftentimes those 10, 20, 30 year tenured employees that are the most excited. Yeah because they've been wanting to do these things. They have felt the pain all along, but maybe they just resigned themselves that you know, my organization is never going to do X, Y, and Z. Right. So for the leaders in the room, how do you kind of tap into um, the opportunities with our employments, employees to embrace this type of technology? Well, that's, that's something very close to my heart. And the re reason why I say that is, Oftentimes, we just feel like doing it on the side and just doing something without the engagement of uh, the front users, you can be successful. That is absolutely wrong. And, and one thing uh, I, I would say to that is, uh, when we talk about innovation, we talk a lot about be curious, think different, mm -hmm. think outside the box, bring ideas. That's always telling at people uh, rather than giving them the tools, sh engaging them in a journey, knowing that because of that, I'm going to need 10% buffer or redundancy in my project planning and execution, that's fine. What I've seen is, uh, and there are a few, uh, 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 a few partners from Hanover here too, what I've seen here is those initial projects, if they are your repeat customers, that means you have done a good job. They are not scared to your point. They've just resigned from this whole process, but instead of telling at them on asking them to be different with the same tools, show them how to do it and engage them with the process. 
Absolutely. Uh, one thing I appreciated from Jim's uh, keynote earlier uh, when he talked about Cincinnati Insurance having one, uh, one database. That was, yes. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but data, I mean, I think, uh, I don't think there's, you know, every insurance executive ever has uttered these words at some point in time. Yeah. We are data rich and knowledge poor, right? Yeah. How many times yeah. have we heard that? And I, I, I believe that automation, intelligence, uh, and AI will ultimately unlock so many opportunities for carriers and organizations that have siloed data sets. Um, what possibilities do you think AI automation will bring from the data perspective? You, you've tinted around a little bit, you know, be able to look at more uh, you know, characteristics, more things than we were in the past. Do you want to start, Heidi? So, um, before we came up for our individual talks, we kind of all sat in a group and we were actually just talking about this in data. So insurance companies have a lot of data and we have it and it's all there and nobody's doing anything. We're collecting it, it's in the data warehouse, where is it? Well, all these technologies <laughs> give you the opportunity to take the data and give it to the people that need to use it to make a decision. So I was on a webinar several months ago with a colleague of yours, um, an underwriting colleague, Tim Dillahunt. Yeah, yeah. And so Tim was talking about this, about even within their company, even within the Hanover, about claims and underwriting. And one's over here and one's over here. And he was saying, okay, so during the, you know, the whole claims process, they were finding out information about these risks. How do you get it to the underwriters so they know that there's something they need to know about this risk because you know we're in our two, you know there, there's all this data, the technology. You know he said that sometimes it works because an adjuster is going to reach out to underwriting, right? But you can't count on that. Yeah. You need to use the technologies to get the data and put it back into the system so the underwriter can be like, oh, there's a vicious dog, and I have a dog. I love my dog, but just saying, but or just any other kind of risk. I, I just think that that's an opportunity. Yeah. And, and uh, just to build on that, I think uh, the profit pool uh, for the companies who do this really well, you're going to differentiate. In the next five years, you're going to see that companies that are using uh, everything that we saw this morning about personalization uh, uh, and, and any uh, buzzword or latest trending topics that you talk about, risk assessment, proactive risk management, risk control, any department within insurance, we are sitting so on, on troves and troves of information and data that is available. Uh, whoever figures out the best way to consume it is really going to see that uh, difference in the uh, profit pools going forward. But I think to your point, it, it's going to take a journey uh, to get there. So uh, hyper-personalization, employee experience, uh, risk assessment, uh, claims identification, uh, it, it, there is an opportunity in each and every department, in my view. Sure, sure. Well, let's wrap up then, uh, maybe one minute each. What's the future then? Uh, let's look, you know, five, ten years down the road. This technology, Prasanna, you said, has been around for a long time. It's, it's come a long way. What's the next turn of the crank or two mean for us? I think uh, I, I like to see more simplicity. Uh, what I say is, we've kind of operated in parallel universes with core technology and uh, new technology where as it relates to digital automation and uh, all the uh, with metaverse coming in all of that i think at some point this converges with modular architecture that we talked about it really starts to hum like a machine where you are now uh, truly uh, doing the exception based work rather than the uh, hard work, the monotonous work that people and systems and machines do today. That's hugely inefficient. So I do see all of this converging uh, together uh, at some point in time. Great. Eileen? Oh, the future. Um, I think using data to make better decisions during the process, giving, giving the people on the ground the information that they need so they can make better decisions It'll make them happier. It'll make your customers happier. Um, I think that's that's really the future. It really reimagining your processes, not just making them digital, but understanding the changes that need to be made. Yeah. 
I'm still waiting for my Iron Man helmet too with my Jarvis personal assistant that can go out and just build things that I say, hey, just go build this for me. Uh, and to give me that uh, kind of real time uh, intelligence and insights that um, uh, we don't otherwise have today. Uh, so, uh, Prashant, Eileen, thank you both very thank much you. for sharing your time thank and your you. insights with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And to keep us on track, I'm going to go ahead and invite our last panel on up. Prashant, thank you. Eileen, thank you. Uh, so while they're coming up, we're going to wrap up this, uh, this first session before lunch uh, with the themes of wrapping it all together, talking about culture of agility, resilience, and innovation. And we're going to do all that like in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> or, you know, maybe it'll take two hours. I don't know. Um, no, we'll get everyone to lunch. So uh, real quick, uh, if everyone could just introduce yourself. We'll start at the end, Jeanette. Yeah, hi, I'm Jeanette Ward. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Texas Mutual. We're the Texas' largest uh, workers' comp carrier with over 40% of the market, and I'm responsible for IT claims, underwriting, safety, call center, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Great, and I'm Bob Pick. I'm CIO of Philadelphia Insurance, Token Marine America, and First Insurance Company of Hawaii. I'm also Deputy Global CIO for Token Marine Group. We're in 40 countries, $40 billion in turn, 40,000 employees. Hi everybody, I'm Gigi Ansel. I'm the industry principal for Mendix, uh, for insurance vertical in North America. Uh, Mendix is a, a modernized uh, enterprise app development platform. It's a low code pr platform. Um, and uh, we have major clients uh, like Zurich Insurance, um, Area Insurance, and Texas Life. And um, looking forward to this session. Wonderful. Good afternoon, my name is Ashish Savani. I'm with uh, Zurich Insurance. Thanks, uh, Gigi. Um, Zurich has been in the industry of uh, doing the risk management and risk consulting for its customers for 150 years now, and all the segments of property, casualty, commercial, personal lines, life, and annuities. Uh, I'm responsible for driving business transformation and strategic initiatives within North America, and in that role, partner with uh, business unit shared services in driving strategic priorities. Awesome. Happy to be here. Well, thank you all for being here, and I know we could spend a lot of time going really deep uh, into each of these three topics for our session. But let's start at the top and let's talk about resilience. So what does a, a culture of resilience mean? What does resilience mean to your organization? And really, uh, in terms of like, what does it mean to be flexible in the face of all the change that's happening today? And Jeanette, let's start with you. Yeah, so I guess two years ago, two and a half years ago, we, we just realized that we all had to be resilient or we <laughs> weren't going to succeed as we dealt with the pandemic. So I think that really comes down to some of the nuts and bolts of having the right systems in place, having the right people in place. I would say um, probably in 2018, I was named COO and then given responsibility for IT. And I kind of was like side with relief in 2020 because we had invested in a lot of the right tools, collaboration tools, business resiliency in that time period that let us on a dime go to completely remote work and continue to actually do a really have really great results from a business perspective even when it seemed like it was going to be disastrous um, so and it was just the nuts and bolts and the tackling and blocking that we'd done the years before in in all of the areas that we really needed to it's become kind of imperative has it? it's imperative yes yeah well. yeah and I would say the same thing we uh, as we traverse COVID the pivot to full work from home uh, Philadelphia insurance for example is 2,000 employees at one point we had 11 that were in the office most of them just yeah. scanning mail and we wore that as a point of pride until we realized that a lot of others had the same experience. And it was because of the, that, those preparatory decisions that you made for other reasons entirely, but they paid off. And that included some early digitalization, uh, digitalization work, getting into e-signature, e-check, e-everything. Maybe we hadn't fully rolled it out across all different aspects. COVID gave us that impetus. But the other thing from a, a resilience and adaptability perspective that I think the last two and a half years has given us, and that is confidence, that we're able to be more flexible than we thought we could be 
And that, in turn, then pays its way forward when we're talking about new products, new markets, engagement with our, with our agents, our insureds. That confidence that came about from being able to pivot and traverse all this stuff really has been very helpful in terms of giving us a feeling that we can be resilient, that we can be adaptable. And that wasn't really entirely the case pre-COVID. So Gigi, maybe even kind of give us a little spin and think about how do we build resilience uh, for insurers? Sure. So I think uh, I, I, I agree with you all the comments. Uh, one of them is your choices uh, and uh, the government, governance within the company. And I also worked for uh, a tier one company for 12 years. So I'm really uh, a hybrid model who transitioned into technology. So I think um, certain things, digitalization, having a cloud native, mobile native, omni-channel uh, capabilities in terms of your choices will, will really pay off, obviously, right? And then um, also, I do believe in building that collaboration between IT and the different business units, because every, there, there isn't only one business unit who wants this or that. There are, everybody has needs. And there are ways to actually accommodate that in a very practical, agile way, fast, and really uh, reliable. So um, I think a little bit the perspective of change instead of, because when I started working into, I'm not going to say, say the year, but <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, what, one thing that struck me, because my background is actually technology consulting, is the silos. It was so siloed, everything was siloed, and then we actually brought those silos into like developed product sequencing model for con because the consumer might need your five of your products, right? Mm -hmm. So same, I think, for the tech uh, choices, uh, tech stack reviews and things, I think a little bit of uh, that building that sustainability model can be a, a good thing way forward if everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just, um, agree with everything that's been said. Uh, and I love Bob and Jeanette, how you also said, you know, so much of this was forced on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've become uh, much more, we, we, we were more resilient all along mm -hmm. than we maybe even gave ourselves credit for or knew. Uh, it certainly tested so many of our organizations. Uh, I think we'd probably all agree that uh, this isn't done. Uh, that uh, the, the speed of change, uh, the, the frequency of these new challenges and opportunities are and have been only increasing. So I'd love your take on what else could we be doing or should we be doing to be even more resilient uh, in the future? So I would say that again, agree with uh, Bob, Janet, uh, Gigi, your viewpoints. I believe that when we talk about resilience, resilience had already always was a function, always was a consideration, not just for our industry, but all the industries across. And the last three years taught us a little different meaning of resilience in general itself. I always believe in the fact that the best day to prepare for a storm is on a calm day. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of us were not prepared enough. Some, some of us were, but not all of us were prepared. It's also the fact that we cannot talk in terms of resiliency for our industry or our organization itself. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about the resiliency for our customers. Amen. And how we, yeah. how we can encourage them, how we can get their journeys expedited to make sure that they're resilient enough when a situation does, does arise that we can work along with them, prepare with that. Mm -hmm. And then last thing, what I kind of relate to it is, COVID and the pandemic gave us a different perspective of resilience, but what we talk about when you think about resilience, it's more in terms of the change management. Mm -hmm. There is a change and we have to adopt to the change. Sometimes we get complacent not realizing that the change is slow and we don't really track that change on a daily basis or a monthly basis or a yearly basis, but change is happening. And resilience is more about being at par with the change, be responsive to our customers and the needs, yeah. and then take it from there. And I think uh, just the whole theme of our panel today, you know, resiliency, agility, innovation, you know, ties so well together. Yeah. Because if you, you know, drew out the Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap between those circles. And in particular, thinking about agility with resiliency. And so, Gigi, maybe with, you know, your IT consulting background, uh, agile, you know, comes up a lot in IT, you know, agile, you know, development methodologies, et cetera. Um, but I think we're starting to see more business areas embrace agile methodologies or agility um, as well. So maybe um, how are you thinking that our insurer audience uh, could you know, prepare for and think about being more agile or having agile thinking? Sure. 
So again, I'll t going back to the prior comment I have made, your choices and the, the, the infrastructure you build and you empower your people. We have clients, for example, Texas Life Insurance, they developed, uh, they turned into a traditional life insurance company, turned into digital native in three months with four developers. So that's really fast. And we have these examples across all of our insurance clients very fast, like Erie Insurance, for example, cut down, cut into half the product delivery to brokers mm -hmm. and then increased policy in force 50%. So I guess that's, um, the ease, easiness and that collaboration, and I guess that certain features, for example, reusable templates in terms of what we provide specifically, that's a, that makes everything ten times faster. And um, and if you know if your people happy, your cust customers happy, um, so then it reflects onto um, business results very significantly. Yeah. Let me go down to Jeanette, then, especially as you mentioned, now having IT mm -hmm. uh, and having some business areas, IT areas, you know, under the same leadership probably gives you a, a, new, a new or unique perspective on what agile can really mean. So, uh, you know, how is, um, how are maybe those agile teams impacting resiliency now from the operational perspective? Yeah, it, we really have been on, I would say, kind of parallel paths. Um, it all kind of started actually doing more customer journey mapping and recognizing those silos and realizing that we needed to create a more seamless experience and that kind of made us think about how we do strategy differently and all of that. Uh, but we were at the same time thinking about why does every system project take forever <laughs> and why can't we move quicker? So we brought in Agilist to help train us and it started as an IT thing mm -hmm. but we've actually now I think shifted where we're embedding agility throughout the organization through really um, focusing on empowerment how do we empower our employees how do we uh, empower them to make good decisions how do we get people together to solve the problem closest closest to where the problem is versus having it come from up on high so we've been kind of on parallel working all those fronts to create a more resilient organization, to move a little faster, to get to a more modern infrastructure, cl all cloud-based, um, with the promise of being able to one day um, really take advantage of all insure tech and, and all the things yeah. we've been talking about today. It feels like it's taking forever, but it also feels like the right thing to do to really instill the cultural changes that come with agility and while we're in parallel working on the technology changes that are going to create a more resilient, sustainable uh, architecture for us to really take advantage of all the promise that, that we have in this room. Yeah. yeah. It's just um, during our last fireside chat, there was a lot of talk about data and, you know, and big data and how we're thinking about data and using you know, automation with data. I think that comes back to uh, the agile notion as well because for so long we've done what we've done, we've made our decisions based on the data we have, uh, but we have so many opportunities now to be more agile in making data-driven decisions. What are you seeing from your chair in terms of agile use of data, either for decision-making or for the kind of that, that process as well? So I'll start with the decision-making process first and kind of touch upon a few of the use cases or examples, not just from a Zurich standpoint, but from an industry standpoint. We spoke a lot about how we are seeing the data being in access, but still being knowledge poor. And I think the challenge, the biggest challenge is how we are consuming those insights or how we, how we are building the insights first and foremost. Okay. Because data in isolation is not insights. Yeah. Data, when you create an ins the structure around it and then create a meaningful structure, that's where it creates insights which can help you make better decisions. So when you think about some of the processes, what we have in the industry, we have processes both on the claim side and the underwriting side, which are extremely manual driven to some extent, but also to the fact that it does not really use or rely on any of the insights which you already have in the organization. So it's more about when you take the use cases of our claims reviews, when we have the claims leaders doing the reviews of their respective claims adjusters or the files in a more reactive manner, using the insights, using the data what we have, using those insights to get them more engaged early on into the process so that they can start doing their claims review earlier on. 
Um, someone touched upon the fact that we have so much of insights which we generate both at the submission process as well as at the claim stages, but we don't have those insights passing back to the underwriters. And that's, it, it's kind of gives you a laugh that it, we have the same conversation across different carriers. No matter which carrier you talk about, you, all of us are kind of going through the same journeys. Yes. So the question is, how do you kind of create that insights which are more shareable across? Mm -hmm. Some of the larger carriers like ours, we have a risk management fun function, or risk resilience function, where we have a different total, different insights of what the customers are doing outside of their policies, outside of their claims. How can we bring back those insights and make them more meaningful? Yeah. So we have the right tools, we have the right data, but we are not building on the right hand sides at times. Bob, you wear a lot of different hats. Um, you, so you've probably seen a lot of different kind of pros and cons with taking a more agile or you know um, data-driven decision making. Could you maybe give us an example of two where you've seen some more fruitful efforts mm -hmm. in trying to adopt uh, a more agile you know, culture? Sure, I, I can think of two. And we have a variety of carrier companies, some acquired, some grown natively that range from $10 million up to many billions of dollars. So yeah. it's, there's definitely a continuum there. But our, our, our parent company, Tokumi Nichito Fire in Japan, which is, for those of you not familiar, like State Farm in Japan, um, a lot of personal lines, also a large life carrier. Um, they actually took the approach when instantiating Agile as a concept of training all the business leaders first. Love it. From the CEO on down, because yeah. they recognize, and I, I definitely agree, that Agile decision making is a critical component before you even get to all the project rituals and that sort of thing. Just being able to think and conceive of a decision that you make as a business executive that isn't shooting for the moon, it doesn't have to be comprehensive and absolute, it can be very incremental. That's a very difficult concept for a lot of folks, particularly in insurance, to get their minds around where we're so used to being data-driven, it's empirically based, done, the decision is made. Well, when you're, you're talking about things like that, uh, the dichotomy between speed and quality, and I would argue it's really between speed and comprehensiveness of functionality, because you really can't give up quality too much. You have to have that agile decision making going on. And as that percolated through the, the ranks in Japan over the course of the last three, four years, we've seen the pace not only from a project, applied project perspective, but even the different types of investments we're making. We recently yeah. got into the VC market, so we're direct investing, not just in insure techs, but in a broad variety of companies that we feel are relevant. The other end of it quickly, uh, you look at Philadelphia Insurance, where we had long taken the approach of really focusing on our core systems and focusing on customer service generally. But in the last four or five years, we've taken the approach of really being focused on ease of doing business. And so many of these conversations over the last day have focused on ease of doing business, pivoting from an external concept to now an internal yes. concept. Mm -hmm. Has to be easy for employees to do our business. Mm -hmm. And so from there, th one of the key things was innovation in a process perspective and from a people perspective. Upskilling business individuals with technology or process skills, for example, making them into product owners. An underwriter who becomes a product owner now is marrying two very distinct skill sets, and we're getting really interesting, useful yeah. results in that that couldn't have occurred even three, four, five years ago because we weren't thinking holistically enough about these. So the agilization, it's, you know, some some organizations have agile as a goal. For us, it's it's a method, yeah. and we mm -hmm. use it where it's appropriate. But now that it's inculcated into a lot of things we're doing that aren't even tech, yeah. people are talking, they're using the terminology, they're even using some of the techniques to do business things, Absolutely. creation of new products. That's been a real game changer for us. You know, one of my favorite aspects of, you know, uh, an agile methodology, and of course you ask 10 different executives to define agile methodology and you get, you know, 20 different <laughs> answers perhaps. But uh, especially in the, in, the, in the developer space, you know, paired programming, where you take, you know, a more tenured programmer, partner them with a junior uh, programmer and have them work together on code, which, you know, so often, you know, might seem just redundant, but they can actually be so much more effective, two brains together, one with the knowledge base, one with kind of the new perspectives mm -hmm. in building not only quickly, but, you know, in quality as well. Uh, and so I love the thought of bringing, you know, underwriters and developers and others together yeah. uh, as part of that agile business implementation. It's just, I want to come back to, um, uh, in kind of our, our third theme on innovation. And it's so often when we talk about innovation, it is such a buzzword because we do sometimes compare it to agility and resiliency. Another one is transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, because so often we think of innovation, we start with technology, uh, but it is so much more than that. 
So from your chair to how are you thinking about transformation, innovation, and implementing you know, measures to um, bring organizations forward? So I think we discussed in one of the previous sessions that what lies at the root cause are your processes. Yeah. You cannot fix your existing processes by bringing on top of it and then bringing a layer of innovation which will solve your business problem. Mm -hmm. So until you go and look at what you're trying to solve, Forget about what the innovation come, what the insure techs of the world, what the innov innovation industry is going to bring forward. What is it that you're trying to bring forward for the change? And the situation could be different. For commercial lines versus personal lines, the situations are very different. But looking at the business processes first, figuring out where the most bang for the buck is, and then figuring out what the innovation solutions are bringing in. Um, the other aspect I think about is also the fact that sometimes the insure techs you work with or the insure techs you engage with, they might not have all the solutions. They might not have all the answers. But engaging with the right players early on and then inculcating with them, mentoring them to develop the right capabilities, it's also the way you can partner with early on. So Zurich has the Zurich Innovation Championship, and it's been running on for the last few years now, where every year we kind of look at the marketplace, invite the vendors to come and then provide their capabilities, discuss the, the, the value propositions, what we're bringing in. And then we send the regional winners to the global championship and mm -hmm. then engage with them. The whole perspective is to have them that exposure with yep. all the countries of Zurich across so that they can engage with us early on. They might not have the solutions, but we want to engage them at the business process level. We want to engage them in, figure, in figuring out what should we be, be focusing on, not to come and telling us that you have this RPA solution, you have this smart automation, and this is going to solve your problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gigi, um, from a technology perspective, uh, what technologies uh, should our carriers be thinking about to help them bridge that gap from as they're going from legacy, not only systems, but even legacy processes uh, to you know, more modern, digital, innovative uh, systems and processes? I think what what we offer as a, as a low code and no code environments is actually really bridging that gap. And I want to um, actually add to Ashish because they're really championing that innovation by because by using Mendex, um, Zurich um, actually got rid of a big backlog that that was a result of Lotus Notes <laughs> <laughs> was like huge, and then getting rid of it opened up actually room for true innovation. And in the UK, um, they launched a face code app, for example, um, that basically you take a selfie, and it takes the, uh, it's for millennials, but it takes it, the journeys from bind to code, uh, code to bind. So ultimately, I guess, uh, innovation is evolution. And I think it starts with, if you make you, I think Jeanette mentioned that it, your choices and reliability, I think, is very important. At certain features like cloud, cloud native, mobile native, got to look into those. And then also that collaboration within the company, being able to address multiple uh, needs mm -hmm. simultaneously, that f speed. And, um, and I think uh, that's, 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 that's the way to go, really. Great. Well, we are about out of time, so I'm going to ask one last question of Bob and then Jeanette. Same question, though, because I want a couple different perspectives on it. Uh, you know, trying to wrap each of these conversations about the future and looking forward. Mm -hmm. uh, technology has evolved so much over the last 10 years. I mean, look at what I'm holding in my hand, this little supercomputer that can do so much. Uh, extend that forward another 10 years. So what is you know, the next generation computing you know, we've gone so far from 3G, 4G to 5G, you know, cellular connectivity. That connectivity, that speed, that data transfer has enabled so much that wasn't possible in the past. So, you know, new data sources and from new sensors, there's so much coming. What's next? What's on the horizon for you uh, in terms of not just technology, but for carriers as they're thinking about their own resiliency, agility, and innovation journeys? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I'll okay. go a little different because this is something I'm extremely passionate about. I was overclaim for a number of years, and uh, I think those of us probably know that right now it's really hard to retain adjusters. Mm -hmm. And when you think about trying to bring in, we, we're doing a grow our own strategy. So I really think the promise of all of this technology 
is to create a really fulfilling job if you're a claim adjuster. It, and I know it's not always, it's one of the hardest jobs, I think, in the whole insurance industry. I take up for them all the time. So when you think about a workers' comp claim, you've got doctor's notes, you have medical narratives, you have pre-auth requests, you have uh, diagnosis codes from the medical billing, you have all of this data. And right now we expect an adjuster to piece together the story of what to do with this claim. And all the data is there, all the promise of pulling it together and creating this sort of, here, this claim, don't touch it, it's fine. It's just do the bare minimum. But this one really requires early intervention and to make sure that the adjusters and the work that they're doing is meaningful. Yeah. And that's where I want to see all of this technology go because I want the humans that work for us to have a fulfilling job and I want to make it easy for them so they want to come and help people every day. Here, here. That's what I'm passionate that's about. Here. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would echo that completely. Uh, I think the more that we can have humans doing interesting, higher order tasks um, and have access to all that glorious data, and you throw in a little quantum there and the ability to just fluidly and of the moment in a very temporal fashion uh, calculate all of that goodness and provide it in a groovy visualization for decision yeah. support and underwriting. I mean, it's it's all right on the precipice, but I, just to answer a little bit differently, I think the, the two things that all this tech is bringing is number one, complication, because we all have the geese that lay the golden eggs today, and you don't want to strangle them for a duck that might lay a silver egg. <laughs> we have to keep feeding all of this, yep. and, but I do think it gives us the opportunity to continue the path that I think most of, most of us are on, and that is getting away from being myopically focused on core systems. And if your core systems are service enabled and they can operate headless, the world's your oyster. You can wrap or anything around it, give the, the, the best user experience that you can, um, and, and I think that's key. But the other, just to close, is, is the opportunities that this creates from a market perspective. So for example, we operate in the US, the largest fleet telematics group um, mm -hmm. uh, out there on the commercial side. And where that telematics is going, the amount of smart car or not smart car, just car, I think the Prashant was saying earlier, um, I think that's key. So, so many opportunities when you consider the future of embedded insurance, different, the need to hedge risk differently in different industries. Automotive yes. is a perennial example. There's great opportunity out there for insurance companies driven by tech that isn't our internal tech, but it's external tech affecting us. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Probably a little scary from time to time too, but that, that'll definitely drive the industry. But definitely a lot of fun too. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, panel, uh, thank you all very much for sharing your time and perspectives today. Great. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.